Well, good morning. Good to see you all. You can join me in the book of Leviticus. And if you don't have a Bible with you, um, you can grab one from a seat under a seat nearby. We're continuing to move our way through the book of Leviticus in just a few weeks left in this uh, series. Let's pray before we begin. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for not being silent to us. Thank you that you speak and give us clarity about who you are as Father, Son, and Spirit, and the source of all goodness and love and truth and beauty. Thank you that you speak truth about who we are and that you have made us to know you. And so we pray in this time with a room full of people who in many ways have turned away from you and still turn often that you draw us to yourself by revealing your beauty in Jesus. Amen. Well, um, just a note here, if you are, are unaware and you'd like to read ahead each week, we do put in our midweek at the end uh, the upcoming sermon text. So I know many of you do that already. So I, I commend that to you. If you don't do that already, just when the midweek comes, you can see the text will be in on Sunday. And so read it ahead, think about it, uh, pray for our gathering together. Um, so if you did read ahead, you know we're in Leviticus 24 this morning. And uh, also one other note before we uh, begin, this past week um, is, uh, was our annual Indianapolis uh, preaching workshop, Simeon Trust preaching workshop. So about, oh, 50 or 60 men from the Indianapolis area were gathered together to grow as uh, faithful preachers of God's Word. Uh, so it's always a highlight um, of the year to be together um, with these other men. And so I'm sharing that with you partly so you can just be encouraged. And I can pass along my encouragement um, about the seriousness with which many men are taking uh, understanding and faithfully communicating God's Word all around the Indianapolis area. So Leviticus 24, one of the stranger chapters in the book to modern ears. Let's jump right in and read it. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil from beaten olives for the lamp, that a light may be kept burning regularly. Outside the veil of the testimony, in the tent of meeting, Aaron shall arrange it from evening to morning before the Lord regularly. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. He shall arrange the lamps on the lampstand of pure gold before the Lord regularly. You shall take fine flour and bake twelve loaves from it. Two-tenths of an ephah shall be in each loaf. And you shall set them in two piles, six in a pile, on the table of pure gold before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each pile, that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion, as a food offering to the Lord. Every Sabbath day Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord regularly. It is from the people of Israel as a covenant forever." And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offerings, a perpetual due. Now an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the people of Israel. And the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. Then they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shelemith, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody till the will of the Lord should be clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor, as he's done it, shall it be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, and whoever kills a person shall be put to death." You shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. So Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and they brought out of the camp the one who had cursed and stoned him with stones. Thus the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay. (laughs) 
So at first glance, this seems at minimum, all the things in this chapter and all them together, at minimum odd. The first part is about a couple furniture items in the tabernacle, a lamp and bread on a table. So that part may seem like a boring, ancient, insignificant ritual. And then the story of a death sentence for cursing God, and that seems to modern ears harsh and medieval. So this is the kind of text that people ignore or avoid. What are we to make of this? It's right here in the Bible. Well, the basic summary is, keep the light burning in the tabernacle, keep the bread fresh on the table, and put someone who curses God to death. But what is this all about? Well, the heart of this text is about desiring and honoring God. In a way that may not be clear to us at first, this text is driving at a question. Do you want God? Do you want to be in His presence? And do you want to honor Him? Or do you reject Him? So in its own peculiar way, this text is actually confronting us today just like Jesus confronted people in His ministry. When He came, people had to make a decision about Him. Some were drawn to Him, Others were repelled by him and rejected him. And plenty of people were in between. But in the end, everyone has to decide. Do you want him and you honor him as the king? Or do you push him aside? And do you reject him? We see people responding like that to Jesus all the time. One woman loved him so much that she came in, she had an experience with him and experienced forgiveness of sins, probably heard his preaching, and then she came into him weeping at his feet and washing his feet with her tears and her hair. And then others hated him so much that they plotted together to put him to death unjustly, without cause. So in the end, everyone will go one of two directions. Either they love him deeply because they know He loves them deeply. Or they reject His love, and they reject Him, and they are cut away from His presence. You desire Him, or you don't. And that will lead you in one of two eternal futures. For you and me, your desire will determine your destiny. So I want to show you that this is what this text is actually getting at. This obscure text in Leviticus. I want to convince you that this is the decision that you have to make for yourself as a result of engaging with this text. So, two desires that determine two destinies. First, desiring God and honoring His presence. Second, rejecting God and dishonoring His presence. So, first, desiring God and honoring His presence. This is the focus of the first section about the lamp and the bread. It's about desiring God's life and light and blessing. So this concerns what's going on in the first room of the tabernacle. So if you're new to Leviticus and the Bible and our church family, tabernacle was a giant portable tent. It was viewed as a traveling home for the presence of God. God, of course, can't be contained in a tent. They knew that, but it was the place for His special presence and blessing for Israel. So picture it like a portable palace for God's presence. It had a courtyard all around it, and then this big tent itself had two rooms. The first room you enter was called the holy place, and then the second room further in was called the most holy place. And the material inside was expensive, beautiful linen. Furniture inside was pure gold filled with symbolic significance. So our text is about two pieces of furniture mainly in that first room, the holy place, the lampstand and the table. So the first part here gives instruction for the priests to keep the lampstand lit. So this lampstand was shaped like a tree. So it had branches moving up. So maybe you've seen a menorah. Uh, it's, It's a symbolic looking tree and each branch curved upward and served as a light, a lamp. Each lamp was filled with a little oil 
so that the flame would burn and it would light that room. And that lampstand was designed to have symbolic significance. So it reminded Israel of probably a couple things. First, it reminded them of their very recent Exodus rescue. That lamp would remind Israel of when Moses had first encountered God's presence. Do you know the Exodus story? Do you remember what the experience was like for Moses when he first encountered God and he heard God speak to him? It was like a bush shrub in flames, lit, so on fire. And so now in the tabernacle, they have this lampstand looking like a bush shrub tree lit up with flames, probably recalls that, the light of God's presence. It also would have reminded them of Eden, reminding them of the tree of life. So this lampstand had flower blossoms, branches like a tree. The flames would recall the lights in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the stars, lighting up God's world. So God filled the world with these lights, and now this tabernacle is in many ways a a mini world, and it has these lights lighting it up. So the lampstand represented God's light and life-giving presence. And God instructed Israel to make sure they keep the oil burning. Keep the oil in there and keep the flames going. So make sure the, the priests light it morning and evening, evening and morning, all the time. God's light was to shine in the tabernacle. And then the light from that lampstand was to shine on the second piece of furniture, which was a table. So there's a table in the tabernacle, and it has 12 loaves of bread on it. Why 12? Well, whenever you see 12 in the Bible, it usually has some connection with Israel, and it's usually on purpose. So what would a table with 12 loaves of bread symbolize? Well, it's a meal, and the bread is there for 12, representing Israel, coming into God's presence to bring this food offering to God, and it symbolized Israel being brought into God's home, seated at a table, eating a meal. And then the priests would then actually eat that bread at the end of the week, and the priests, of course, represent the people of God. So, in many ways, this is a symbolic meal in God's presence. And verse 8 says it's a meal from Israel as a covenant. So, it's connected to their covenant, like a covenant meal. So, this would have recalled for them a certain meal in particular, again, very recent in their history. It would likely recall the covenant meal at Sinai. So God brought Israel out of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai, made a covenant with them, which is a a binding relationship with vows, much like a marriage. And like marriages often have a reception with a meal, covenants would be confirmed with these covenants as well. And so the Israel uh, elders went up the mountain, up Mount Sinai, and it says they beheld God and they ate and they drank. And so it would recall this covenant meal in God's presence, this ideal for the people of God. And all of this would also echo Eden. God created Adam and Eve to live in His presence. If sin had never entered the world, I mean, imagine what that would be like. Would you get a picture by reading Genesis 1 and 2? We have God with His people. We have Him spreading a feast before them. You can eat from any tree you want except one. And they enjoy His life and His grace in paradise, feasting in His presence. That's the ideal for God's people, a world filled with a meal with God and His people, feasting. So, what's with this text then? What's the point? Well, what's being emphasized here? Well, as we read it, the priests we see need to keep the lamp burning and keep the bread fresh. Over and over, it says continually, regularly, keep the flames going, and get the bread on the table refreshed every week. So, here's the big picture. This is an instruction for the priests to keep up the symbol uh, of the room, keep up the symbolic drama. And the drama portrays Israel in the light of God's presence, feasting in His home. It's a picture of Israel feasting at a table in the home of God, basking in His presence. And so, the tabernacle was viewed as God's home, like His royal palace, And the point of the chapter is to say, the light is always to be on, food is always to be on the table. Someone is always home. God is always with you. So, you know, if you take a walk this evening and you walk by a house and it's like seven o'clock, starting to get a little dark outside, but still pretty early in the evening, and the lights are all off, you know no one's home. The place is lit up, Smoke coming from the chimney, someone's home. And so, this is a way of having God's tabernacle in their midst, His 
his palace saying, the lights are always to be on. God is always home, and there's always a fresh meal on his table. So if Israel obeys these commands, they are saying, yes, we want you here. We want to communicate that you're with us. We want your presence with us. We will keep the light on. We'll keep the bread fresh. We'll keep this symbol going of of your reality with us here because you are with us. In other words, to obey the first nine verses here was for Israel to say, we love you. We're glad you're here. We're happy to obey you. And we honor your presence among us. And think about the priests who do this. These may seem like pretty menial tasks. Get the oil from the people. Replace it in the lamp every evening, every morning, day after day, week after week, year after year, decade after decade. Get in the oil, keeping it lit. Make the bread, keep it fresh all the time. Seems as we read through Israel's history that most of them actually didn't care. They needed new hearts. It's the whole point of Jesus coming and bringing what the Bible calls a new covenant, but some people did. And those who did care wouldn't have minded such menial tasks. In fact, they would have counted a privilege. Listen to Psalm 84. I remember there was a song written from this, uh, this psalm, Psalm 84. We used to sing a lot in campus ministry a, a while back. It says this, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. And then the one who wrote that psalm added this note, which would have resonated with those who replaced the oil and replaced the bread if they actually had a heart for God. It says this, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So here's the question for you and me. Do you desire God like that? One way to find out is to ask this question, which we sometimes ask one another. What's your ideal vacation? What's your ideal evening? Uh, Where would you love to live if you could live anywhere at all? And who do you want to be there? In other words, where do you want to be, really? Where would you like to be? And who do you want to be there? That's a revealing question. Here's what God plants inside the hearts of all of his people. An answer to that question like this. I want to be with Jesus. Wherever he is, I want to be there. And I want to be with those who know him and love him. When someone becomes a Christian, it's because God plants at least the seed of that desire inside their heart. It may be small to start, but it's there and it's real. You see his love for you. You see that he's willing to forgive all your sins and your rejection of him. And you say, okay, thank you for loving me. I receive your grace and I want to love you back. And so if you don't have that desire at all to say, I want to be with Jesus, you're not a Christian. Every Christian has at least a seed of that real true desire to be with Jesus. And so God commands Israel, keep the light on, keep the food on the table, because I'm here. Yes, this is a temporary symbol-laden picture, but it's what I have for you now. It'll get better. Jesus is coming. The new creation will come in its fullness one day, but for now, this is it. So these little commands then are far from arbitrary or obscure or random when we see them in light of what's going on in Leviticus, right? Chapter 24 is saying, do you want me here? Will you honor my presence? If so, then this is how you show it. You keep the light shining. You keep the bread fresh. So now what if we don't want this? Or let's go further. What if you want the opposite of this? What if rather than honoring God, you would rather see him gone? Well, that's what we see in the next story. It's a contrast. So second, rejecting God and honoring his presence or dishonoring his presence. So the focus of verses 10 to 23 is an extreme contrast. So here's the story. There's a man 
who's of a mixed heritage. So his mother is an Israelite. His dad was an Egyptian. And this guy didn't grow up apparently to follow the one true God. So side note, warning for Christians not to marry those who do not know and love Jesus. Um, Christians should love and befriend and bless all that they come in contact with, all who don't know Jesus, but they shouldn't marry them. The Apostle Paul says as much, and I can give you a list of people who will tell you from their own story that it brings a host of challenges. So this guy grew up in Israel, but he rejected the one true God, and one day he got in a fight with an Israelite, and he cursed God. So he brings up God's name, and he cursed it. Now, we may read this and think, so is this like little neighbor kid Ricky who says, OMG? Like, is that what's going on here? Because this is pretty strong reaction to that kind of thing. Uh, I think not. So this guy is probably an adult. He's called a son, not because he's a kid, but because his parents' ethnic heritage matters. He's the son of an Israelite and an Egyptian. And he's not just flippantly using God's name. He's rejecting God and speaking a curse against God, his name. And so God gave Israel his name, Yahweh, meant something, meant something important, probably carries the sense of I'm with you and for you. Names represent the character of a person and the life of a person. So it was so honored, the name Yahweh was so honored by Israel at one point that they stopped even pronouncing it out loud. Not that they should have stopped pronouncing it, but they did it at least out of a, a kind of reverence for him. Yet here this guy curses it, publicly repudiating God's authority as king. So this is a moment of cosmic treason. So Israel's thinking, what do we do about this? And so God tells them, and the answer is, you need to put him to death. Now that raises questions about justice, right? Is that fair? Is that just? It's really interesting. That's exactly what God seems to address here. When he tells them what to do with the man, he adds some other laws, and they're all laws about justice. It's verses 17 to 22. It's what we call the lex talionis, or justice means here, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. Now, these weren't carried out literally, but as a principle of fairness. So, we don't have any records in Israel where if you put out someone's eye, you have your eye put out. The point is, you have to have an equal payment. The, the punishment needs to fit. And so, here's a, por- a few important notes about this. First, this is about commensurate punishment. So, the punishment has to fit the crime. Punishment needs to be proportionate to the crime. Second, this was limiting the consequences in that culture, actually. So we hear this, and we're like, wow, that seems pretty harsh. But actually, at the time, punishments could very quickly escalate. Revenge was common. So in many cultures there, if someone knocks out your tooth, you could say, they should die. Someone punches you, you get to beat them up. But this is saying, no, only equal punishment. And third, this is actually upholding the value of life. Many people today think that the death penalty doesn't value life, but the opposite's true. The rationale for the death penalty in some cases here is that life is valuable. So if you unjustly take someone's life, you forfeit your own because their life matters and they're made in God's image. And that's... uh, a big summary, kind of high level of these justice laws, but what's probably most striking about these laws is their context in this chapter. God defines justice as equal and proportionate. And the context here is saying that a man who curses God deserves to die. The point seems to be, yes, to publicly, decisively proclaim that God should be dead warrants death. Now, that's not to say that every nation needs this in their laws. I'm not arguing for that. Modern nations are not equivalent to ancient Israel. The point, though, is that cursing God like this is morally equivalent to unjust killing. So, let's just think it through and try to understand this. God is the giver of all goodness in life. Every breath that we take, every breath that you have taken so far this morning has been a gift freely from Him. Every bite of food you eat is ultimately from His hand. Every sight you see 
is a gift of His grace, moment by moment. It's His infinite wisdom in creating your eyes and making them work. Every good gift you have is from God. And then to go and get to a point in your heart and your mind and your life where you can raise your fist to heaven and give Him the finger and publicly, decisively curse Him, functionally calling for His death, to say good riddance, to say forget you, to curse Him. What does that say? Well, for God to give this person death is in one sense simply to say, okay, I'll remove my goodness from you. You don't, you don't want me? I won't keep giving you breath. I won't keep giving you life and light and joy. If you wish me dead, then I'll let you go on as though I'm not really here. That means you can't keep going on. He's taking away the life that he's graciously giving. There's something, I mean, doesn't that make a little more sense, at least so we can get in the thought process here? Now, there's something of that attitude of this man in every sin. God is the source of all that's good. And when we sin, we are in that moment pulling away from him. We're pulling back from him. We're resisting his love and his laws. The Puritan pastor Thomas Watson put it this way. What a horrible thing this is for a piece of proud dust to rise up in defiance against his maker. That's, that's what every sin ultimately is. A piece of proud dust, from dust to dust, rising up in defiance against our maker. And so this man shows us what sin looks like when it's full grown. It's an outright defiant public rejection of God. So this is clearly a stark contrast to the first half of the chapter, or part of the chapter. It's the epitome of dishonoring God and rejecting His presence. Now let's consider both of these stories together. One shows us what it's like to desire God. The other shows us what it's like to reject God. So picture God as the sun, the center of the solar system of our lives. Now just think of the sun. If you respect the sun and enjoy the sun, what do you do? You get in its light. You enjoy its warmth. You receive its life-giving energy. And you also respect it. Because if you don't respect it, what happens? You get burned. It is a massive ball of hot gas, and it's in flames, and it's over a hundred times the size of the earth. If you get within even three million miles, you will be incinerated. So we enjoy the sun, and we respect the sun, and we do the same with Jesus. Matthew 11 shows how Jesus says in this chapter, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus Christ is the source of the soul-level rest that we all long for, whether we know it or not. He's the one who can calm our culture from its anxiety. He can give joy to the depressed, give hope to those who feel hopeless. He invites everyone, all of us, to come to Him, to trust Him, to receive the rest that only He can give. And yet in the same chapter, Matthew 11, it says this, He began to denounce the cities where most of His mighty works had been done because they did not repent. He said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. If you want to find out what the Bible says about hell, and you kind of just read it from beginning to end or you search it, you're going to be dealing a lot with Jesus because he speaks about it more than anywhere else in the Bible. And he doesn't speak about it because he's mean, but because he's just and because he wants to warn us and wake us up so we don't go there. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 11, note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity to those who have fallen, but kindness to you, provided 
you continue in his kindness. Leviticus 24 is showing us the kindness and the severity of God. It invites us to receive God's kindness or face his severity. It leads us to ask the question, do I want him or do I despise him? So that's what happened when Jesus came. God's presence has come to us, forcing everyone to make a decision. Do you want him or do you reject him? And the consequences are eternal. So if we move ahead to Revelation 21, we see where our text is heading. The new creation at the end of the Bible is described like Eden and like the tabernacle and like the temple in Israel. And Revelation 21, 5 says this, And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And listen to this invitation. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. If you want God, if you are thirsty for him, he will quench that thirst and satisfy you. But what about the alternative? A few verses later. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So the question this text asks us is, where are you? Now, you may not feel like either of the extreme responses that we've seen here and that I've been talking about. Maybe you feel like you neither love Jesus nor you outright reject him. But the reality is that we are all on a spectrum, right? One to a hundred. This text describes the one and the 100, and we're somewhere in between. So let's say one is cursing God, and 100 is treasuring him above all things. I doubt anyone in here is totally on either end of that spectrum. So you may be thinking, I'm somewhere in between, and that's probably true. So I don't doubt that. The reality is we're somewhere between. So this text is inviting you wherever you are, to move closer, to move toward him. So if you're a, I don't know, just in your mind, just what number would you say you are? If if 50 is maybe the turning point where you have that desire for God planted within you, where are you? Maybe you're at a 20. Well, then what questions do you still have? What's your hang-up still to following Jesus? Um, What... What do you still wonder about? This is an opportunity to identify those questions and then pursue them. I'd love to talk with you. Uh, I'd love to connect you with someone else to maybe read the Bible with them or read through um, the Gospel of Mark, which tells the story of Jesus, to figure out who is he really? Uh, Did he really rise from the dead? If he did, seems like that means I should take him seriously. Um, And so how can you move closer? Or maybe you're at a 49 You feel right close uh, to the center point where you click over, but you're still hesitant to go all in with Jesus. You're convinced that he's the Savior, that he rose from the dead after dying for your sins, but you haven't yet actually committed yourself to him. You You believe the truth of it, but you don't believe him. You don't trust him. You haven't repented of your sin and trusted him. So the question for you is what's keeping you now at this point from doing that? from just falling all in toward him? What's holding you back? Identify that. Or maybe you've crossed 50 and you're at 51 and you've been at 51 for a while. You're now trusting Jesus, um, but you're kind of stuck right at the beginning. If that's, if that's you, what step can you take to get to know God and to be more fully resting in him and his grace? Leviticus 24 makes us ask this question. Would I rather be a doorkeeper or a lamplighter or a bread baker in God's presence than anywhere else? And maybe we're not sure of our answer if we're honest until we realize this. Before he came, what would Jesus have said about where he would rather be and who he would like to be with? What a wonder that apparently for Jesus he said, I want to be with them, these rebels and sinners, to die for their sins, 
to rise again and then to give them new hearts that they might, they might actually see reality for what it is and love me and share in honoring the Father. And then they can be with me where I am forever. And that's his heart in John 17. You can go read it. Um, if he has that heart for us, how can we not say, I want to be with him wherever he is? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, in many ways, strange text to us. And yet we see here that uh, this makes sense in light of who you are and what you've been saying from the beginning in the Bible and who we've come to know Jesus to be. And so we pray that you would plant that desire in any hearts where it's not yet there. That some who have come this morning uh, oblivious to you or ignoring you or just questioning would have this seed of desire in them and they trust you. And we pray that you would cultivate and fan into flame in the hearts of those who you've already drawn to yourself. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.